You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, here from New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. How are you doing today, Prashant? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Uh, happy December. We're getting to the close of not only this year, but also this decade. Uh, for listeners, definitely stay tuned because we're going to be doing a couple episodes reflecting on the year that has just passed us and also reflecting a little bit on the trends that really defined Asia and the Asia-Pacific region uh, over the past 10 years. It's really been a, a transformative decade for the region. So Prashant and I will be back before the end of the year to talk about uh, some of those issues. But Before we close out, we did want to come back to a topic that has been a regular on this podcast and one that we actually found ourselves not being able to get away from for a long time. But I was just looking back at our recent catalog, and we actually haven't talked about this issue since October, which is the Korean Peninsula. Uh, So, Prashant, I think we're a little bit overdue to come back to Korea. Um, And there's a few reasons for that. I mean, we're looking down the barrel of uh, North Korean leader Kim uh, Jong-un's self-proclaimed end-of-year deadline. And of course, uh, many people don't seem to be aware of this deadline, including uh, most recently uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, uh, David Stilwell, who in a press briefing seemed to be unaware until he was informed by uh, one of his deputies that Kim Jong-un had declared a deadline for the end of the year. Uh, So the deadline um, was announced in mid-April at Kim's uh, speech to the Supreme People's Assembly in North Korea when he said that a third summit with the United States would only become possible if Washington were to take a, quote, bold decision and reevaluate its policy. Basically, Kim Jong-un wanted the United States, or he, he needed to see a sign that the United States had moved away from the negotiating position that ended up causing the collapse of the Hanoi summit at the end of February, which was that the United States was unwilling to broach the issue of sanctions relief without a complete uh, process, or North Korea agreeing to a complete denuclearization roadmap. Of course, that hasn't happened, and now we're basically, uh, you know, little more than uh, three weeks away from the end of the year, uh, which now looks like might result in a North Korean demonstration of some sort. Uh, There have been other indications in recent days that the North Koreans might take steps even before the end of the year. For example, they recently lashed out at Japan, and they most recently, right before we recorded this podcast, released a statement saying that the United States is, uh, you know, depending on the U.S.'s behavior, uh, it will receive a Christmas present of its choosing. Effectively, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un, wants to see if the United States is going to be naughty or nice, uh, to uh, put it in uh, those terms. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, things aren't looking too good on on the on the Korean Peninsula front. Um, so Prashant, I mean, uh, you know, from, from where you're sitting, uh, what do you think is likely to really happen here before the end of the year? It really seems like the United States has lost all interest in pursuing negotiations with North Korea since the breakdown of working level talks in Stockholm in October. Yeah, so I think as as you correctly summed it up, right? So the the I guess the big worry is that the confluence of several events. So you have Kim Jong Un's uh, end of year deadline. You have 2020 being sort of an election year for Trump, and he has effectively positioned the North Korean issue as being one of his key foreign policy issues. Where he said, you know, he's departed from his predecessors and he's tried to embark on a different approach. And so any sort of indications that his approach is not working or is working, he would you know, want to be keen to play that up. So you have the North Korean deadline, you have the, the, the Trump re-election, and then you also have the fact that South Korea is also approaching legislative elections, I think April next year. Mm-hmm. And so given the confluence of all three of those developments, 2020 is shaping up to be this sort of very important year for North Korea and that challenge, and the fact that we're seeing the North Koreans give out, you know, rhetorical statements like that, um, including the the deadline, um, you know, that doesn't seem to bode well for how the North Korean issue is going to play out. Whether it's you know the, the either the Christmas gift or uh, you know coming into the new year um, and how that issue is going to play out into 2020. So it seems like you know of the various flashpoints that we're talking about in, in Asia. Uh, the North Korean nuclear question seems to be the one that, you know, is, is going to be dominating the headlines, in, you know, the next few weeks. And we've already seen, you know, any number of pieces coming out saying, you know, 2020 is is the big sort of breakthrough year for North Korea. It could be a major crisis. Um, and so I, I think one of the other, you know, things that's interesting to talk about is if Kim Jong-un senses that, you know, President Trump, really his attention is, you know, a little bit distracted, maybe he's not going to get much out of out of Trump. Uh, you know, North Korea may be keen to send a message in terms of some kind of missile test or development. Uh, I think, as you pointed out in a piece that you wrote for us, 
Um, but I, I also sense that, I mean, I'm not sure what kind of message he'd want to send because I'm assuming the North Koreans would also, on the other hand, not want to provoke uh, President Trump and generate sort of a major loss of face for him to to engineer this crisis, right? Because they may want to wait for mm-hmm. another U.S. president potentially who might be willing to negotiate with them. So I think, you know, one of the interesting things would be interesting to hear your, your insights on that. I mean, what you know, if you're a Kim Jong-un, you know, how do you kind of play this uh, between, you know, demonstrating a message to the United States that, you know, this kind of waiting game, the U.S. election doesn't really work for North Korea, but on the other hand, also leaving the room open for for a next uh, U.S. president as well, because Kim Jong-un has lasted, uh, and the Kim family in general has lasted multiple uh, U.S. presidents, uh, and this will just one other one that's going to last out. Yeah, sure. I mean, absolutely. I think I think the other thing, though, is that, you know, even if Trump is removed from office next year, um, either through impeachment or through an election, um, I think the North Koreans know that they're not going to get a U.S. president that's going to be willing to show up to a summit without any real agenda to just, you know, meet with Kim Jong-un and see what can happen. So for the North Koreans, in many ways, I mean, Trump was really a once in a lifetime opportunity. And while things worked out well in Singapore, they didn't work out well in Hanoi. And now I think, you know, they're recalibrating. I think, you know, in terms of the sort of guardrails on North Korean decision making, uh, I think there are multiple, right? So first of all, I mean, no North Korean missile test is ever just conducted as a show of frustration or anger. The North Koreans usually have multiple objectives, tactical and strategic, in conducting these tests. I mean, There are objectives that are mundane, like validating and testing new technology. In fact, I think that's been a big part of the testing campaign this year after Hanoi, when they realized that, you know, their, quote, good behavior uh, in 2018 didn't really yield any dividends. They decided, well, why are we, you know, why are we behaving the way that we are? Why don't we conduct some tests and validate some new weapons that we've been working on? So that's exactly what they did. They conducted more than 24 ballistic missile tests uh, this year, beginning in May. So it was a compressed testing campaign. And actually, by my count, uh, this year is actually the busiest missile testing year in North Korean history. Um, So the North Koreans seem to be on a very, you know, they're back to their old ways of validating and developing new systems. Most of the systems tested this year contribute to their conventional deterrence, but they also tested a new submarine launch ballistic missile that is expressly designed for strategic nuclear delivery. Um, and that may be something that they again test uh, before the end of the year, depending, uh, you know, depending on how you read their recent uh, challenge to Japan and Shinzo Abe and the U.S. Uh, Christmas gift uh, message. So there's that. The other issue is going into the next year, um, the North Koreans have actually invested quite a bit of diplomatic capital in shoring up their relationships with Russia and China since mm-hmm. the beginning of this diplomacy in, in 2018, right? I mean, um, we shouldn't forget that before, I mean, for the first uh, seven years of Kim Jong-un's leadership, Kim had zero meetings with any foreign leaders, and that includes uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, right? I mean, China and North Korea are often talked about as having a very special historical relationship, but the relationship between uh, Beijing and Pyongyang was actually quite poor, especially between 2014 and the, the first part of 2018. And it was only with the March 2018 meeting between she and Kim, which was Kim's first meeting with a foreign leader, that things began to slowly change. And the two leaders have had five summit meetings since then and appear to be more coordinated than ever at the highest level. So if the North Koreans especially begin resuming, for example, nuclear tests, I think that would cost them quite a bit with China. China does not want to see nuclear tests resume at Punggye-ri for a variety of reasons, including the fact that, you know, North Korea's most recent thermonuclear test in September 2017 actually caused tremors on the Chinese side of the border. Um, And, you know, they're, of course, worried about uh, things like environmental venting of radionuclides and things like that. So I don't think the North Koreans are going to go back to nuclear testing. With Russia, too, they've expended quite a bit of capital. And, you know, they've had ups and downs. There was a recent incident where uh, North Korean fishermen actually fired on a Russian uh, FSB uh, in Russia's exclusive economic zone that caused quite a bit of a tiff in in, in the bilateral. So the North Koreans are looking to calibrate that as well. The point I'm making here is that, you know, if things do begin to go south with the United States, uh, the North Koreans are going to have to hedge that by turning to the other great powers. And this is where I think Kim Jong-un maybe has learned from his grandfather's uh, maneuvering during the Sino-Soviet split um, in, in the late 60s and 70s, where playing great powers against each other became quite useful for North Korea. Uh, and today, in these, you know this new era of great power competition, so to speak, um, I, think, I think the North Koreans can actually quite do quite a bit um, with China and Russia. Uh, of course, you know, we're we're nearing a important deadline on the UN sanctions regime too before the end of the year on December 20, mm-hmm. um, December 22nd, 2019, which is exactly two years after the Security Council adopted Resolution 
2397, uh, which was the final resolution adopted in 2017 after the November 28th test of the Hwasong-15 intercontinental range ballistic missile. Uh, that resolution called on all UN member states to expel North Korean workers, and that deadline is coming up. Um, so I think I think many folks are also interested to see how this um, how the pressure of sanctions will ramp up on North Korea in 2020, which means that they can't afford to alienate uh, China and Russia as well. So that I think is an important part of the conversation here. It's not all about the United States and North Korea. It's also about China and Russia. And of course, you know, I, th I think what uh, gets left out also is that uh, the inter-Korean relationship, which was mm -hmm. at one point the driver of engagement with North Korea under uh, President Moon Jae-in, certainly, is now, uh, I think, in a very bad place. Uh, the, the Comprehensive Military Agreement of September 2018 signed in Pyongyang uh, when uh, Moon was there for the uh, inter-Korean summit with Kim, um, that deal is, a, is pretty much dead at this point. I mean, the South Koreans have alleged that North Korea violated it with its recent artillery drills, uh, in the in the West Sea, so uh, things aren't looking too good overall. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that also raises a, a, another bigger question about you know, let's just say you know, for example, we, we we've had this uh, sort of period of engagement between the United States and North Korea, where essentially the Trump administration has tested uh, this idea that you know we've tried all the other approaches under you know previous presidents, you know, under Bill, Bill Clinton, under George W. Bush, under Barack Obama. And that you know maybe we should try a different approach where we start at the very top with the two two leaders. You have multiple summit meetings, and let's see how uh, things play out. You know, let's say that that process stops, and we get to a process where the North Koreans um, resume testing, including of longer range missiles. You know, what essentially would we conclude about what's been achieved with respect to this process of North Korean engagement? Right. So it seems like. On the one hand, the North Koreans seem to have gained a little bit in terms of their diversification of their relationships, not only with, you know, initially engaging the United States, but also uh, Russia and China. Um, and as you pointed out, I mean, if you look at it quantitatively, you know, there have been multiple uh, tests uh, this year itself, let alone what will happen next year. So I guess the big question is, you know, if this period or window of engagement actually ends, what would the United States uh, have actually achieved with respect to this addressing this North Korean challenge? And, and what would the North Koreans claim that they have achieved in, in response? Well, so I think I think the biggest thing is that, you know, quantitatively or qualitatively, we haven't done anything meaningful to constrain mm -hmm. North Korea's capabilities. The only thing that we have done is prevented or, you know, because of the North Koreans unilateral gesture in April 2018 when they announced a moratorium on intercontinental range ballistic missile testing and nuclear testing. As a result of that moratorium, we've prevented or we haven't seen the North Koreans uh, conduct further testing of their ICBMs or conduct new nuclear tests, which would have value for the qualitative um, sophistication of their program, right? So that has some value, and I think sustaining that for as long as we did, uh, we can look back on that and say that that was a good thing because, uh, you know, in the alternative uh, universe where the North Koreans continue ICBM tests into 2018, I mean, first of all, given the way that the administration was reacting to those tests, a military conflict might have been likely, and that would have been disastrous. Mm -hmm. But also, um, it, even if we didn't have a military conflict, the North Koreans would have probably validated things like their reentry vehicle technology, which you know I consider to be credible enough, uh, but the North Koreans likely would want to validate that with further testing. So insofar as we managed to not see tests like that, there was some value. But I mean, the bigger question is that, and this, you know, you saw in the UN panel of experts report, uh, the midterm report that came out recently, is that quantitatively, behind the scenes, the North Koreans have been hard at work. I mean, they've been producing uh, more fissile material, probably manufacturing more nuclear warheads out of that fissile material, and manufacturing ballistic missiles. Uh, effectively, what happened in 2017, and part of the reason the crisis in 2017 was so dangerous was that North Korea's sophistication as a nuclear weapons power rose very quickly, right? They they demonstrated capabilities that they hadn't before in terms of um, delivery systems and ranges. They demonstrated unambiguously that they could range the U.S. territory of Guam. They demonstrated unambiguously that they had systems that could range the continental United States. They demonstrated a thermonuclear weapon capability. But quantitatively, things were still quite delicate for them, which meant that in a crisis— uh, the so-called, you know, use or lose incentives for North Korea would be quite 
acute. And today, if North Korea has a larger arsenal, uh, in a way, if we do return to a crisis with them, those incentives might not be as acute because the North Koreans are going to be a more capable, more robust nuclear power. But of course, what that means for the future of U.S. engagement with North Korea is quite dire because we're going to be dealing with a much more sophisticated, much more dangerous North Korea that's got even better, you know, even more reasons to be confident in its capabilities and even more reason to concede less at the at the negotiating table in the future. So that is going to make things difficult. Uh, but of course, in the meantime, you know, we've also had the intensification of the sanctions regime. Mm -hmm. Implementation continues to be lacking, especially with things like, you know, China not enforcing ship to, illicit ship to ship transfers inside of its territorial waters. The Chinese border remains quite porous. Uh, the United States has not yet gone, you know, full speed ahead with secondary sanctions against Chinese financial institutions and Russian financial institutions that might be working with North Korea. Um, but all of these dynamics, I think, uh, come together to present a much more challenging picture. So in a way, I mean, the fact that um, Kim began his outreach at a time when Trump was willing to reciprocate and certainly Moon Jae-in was willing to reciprocate, mm -hmm. it was sort of the perfect confluence of factors that allowed for this brief lull that really resulted in no realistic change to North Korea's capabilities, right? I mean, the offer they had on the table in Hanoi, in hindsight, if we had taken that offer, and just to, you know, if listeners uh, aren't familiar with that offer, what the North Koreans offered in Hanoi was to give up all of their highly enriched uranium and plutonium, basically weapons fuel production at the Yongbyon site. And that's one site among many, uh, but it is the sole source of plutonium production in North Korea. As far as we know publicly, uh, there are covert uranium enrichment sites, of course. But they had offered that up in exchange for a very capacious uh, package of sanctions relief. And of course, given the relief they were asking for, the Trump administration said, no, that wasn't a fair exchange. But in hindsight, I think, you know, many, many analysts are going to look at the deal in Hanoi as sort of a missed opportunity. The fact that we didn't negotiate that into perhaps a smaller deal where we give them less sanctions relief in exchange for less um, in, in terms of uh, what they give up on fissile material, that would at least have opened the door to future engagement. But alas, we never got there. And then uh, President Trump effectively lost interest. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, today, as we record this podcast, is December 3rd, uh, the NATO summit is happening in London and President Trump, uh, I believe, gave his more, um, gave his most extensive remarks on North Korea in what, to my ear, appears to be months. He hasn't really spoken about North Korea in a long time. And, uh, you know, it's it's a little concerning because, you know, he began, um, he he resumed his use of the term rocket man for Kim Jong-un, mm -hmm. which uh, to anybody that lived through the 2017 crisis should be not a good sign. Uh he also talked about p potential military conflict and how devastating that would be. And, you know, he went back to his old spiel that, you know, the his his presidency coincided with this lull with North Korea, that we have peace now, that, you know, the reporter asking him about North Korea building out its capabilities. Trump said that, you know, you don't know that. But to my ear, I mean, this seems like we're looking at a brewing crisis for 2020. It looks like the the sort of delusions that the administration was operating under, you know, the final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea, as agreed by Chairman Kim in Singapore, as Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, loved to say over and over, those delusions are, you know, they incurred a debt to reality. And mm -hmm. that debt is about to be paid in 2020. Right. And I, I would just add also, I mean, it, it does seem that, I mean, to the extent that benefits were um, actually reached on on issues like the, the moratorium um, and the period of engagement, you know, relative to the period of, you know, fire and fury, um, you know, there has been sort of a narrowing of the aperture of U.S. North Korea policy, right? We've had all these uncertainties about, you know, to what extent that the, does the United States care about other aspects of the North Korea problem, including human rights, where, you know, President Trump and other members of the administration have spoken occasionally about it, but then President Trump, you know, hasn't focused on that. Subsequently, You've had, you know, we've talked about in this podcast previously about issues regarding the U.S.-Japan alliance, the U.S.-South Korea alliance, and also uh, these issues of decoupling, uh, you know, shorter range missiles versus longer range missiles. So all these uncertainties, I, I, I think, also add to, to the uh, perception that, you know, whatever benefits were accrued in this period of engagement, you know, might be offset with, by some of these challenges uh, um, and issues that we've seen. I guess one of the other issues, um, you know, just to close uh, on the podcast is looking ahead to 2020, we've, we've sort of talked about earlier, you know, some of the uh, issues, deadlines and, and events and developments that we might look to. I mean, one, obviously, that we've talked about on the podcast previously is Kim Jong-un's, uh, you know, annual address, uh, which could give us some insights as to North Korea's uh, policy, 
we've talked about the South Korea legislative elections that could, you know, say something about, uh, you know, Moon Jae-in and his popularity, which, you know, he's been an important driver in, in, in this process and inner Korean engagement is also an important variable in this whole equation. Um, but what are some of the other things that we should kind of keep in mind in, in 2020 that, that would be important for, for listeners to watch? Well, so, you know, looking looking ahead, um, one of the questions that I've been getting a lot is what exactly are the North Koreans going to do, right? So, I mean, uh, they've already been testing missiles. They've tested nuclear-capable missiles like the submarine launch ballistic missile. Um, so what kind of capabilities might they seek to pursue or develop in, in the first half, let's say, of 2020? So I've been seeing a lot of indicators, um, you know, even going back to 2017, that the North Koreans have been working on what appears to be a new space launcher. Uh, we haven't had a space launch in North Korea since February 2016. In the meantime, uh, in the almost uh, four years that have elapsed, uh, the North Koreans have maintained their space program rather well. Uh, they have a new uh, satellite control center in Pyongyang that's been uh, opened and maintained in the meantime. The Sohei satellite launch site is well maintained. Uh, you know, that was one of the facilities that the North Koreans had agreed to dismantle oh. in the September 2018 inter-Korean summit if the United States had pers followed through with corresponding measures, i.e. sanctions relief, which we never did. Uh, so we never got dismantlement. So I think that's something I'd watch for. The other issue is that, you know, if things do go belly up after Kim Jong-un's uh, New Year's Day address where he might, you know, do all sorts of things, including declare an end to this diplomatic process, say that the moratorium no longer applies on missile testing and nuclear testing, it's highly likely that the United States and South Korea are going to resume their springtime exercises at a magnitude that resembles what used to occur in the past. Uh, you know, some, some exceptions to that include Trump potentially torpedoing the alliance with South Korea entirely in that you know, before that happens. Uh, but if that happens, then we have a very dangerous situation because then as we, uh, you know, as, as listeners might know, North Korea reacts very negatively to those mass mobilization exercises. They used to be called Key Resolve and Full, full Eagle before the beginning of the diplomacy uh, in, uh, in 2018. And uh, if, if we do resume full-scale allied exercises, uh, there's no telling what kind of demonstrations the North Koreans might stage. They might uh, you know, go back to what they did in, for example, March 2017 when the exercises began, which is the first time they did a five-missile salvo test into the Sea of Japan to show that they could um, launch multiple ballistic missiles in a coordinated form to stress missile defenses. They might do something like that again. Uh, of course, you know, that would be a, a very negative development. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a, 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 a there's a lot here. And also on the internal mm -hmm. side for North Korea, I think it's worth watching for signs that Kim Jong-un might decide to abandon his quote, new strategic line that he announced in April 2018, which was to focus all efforts domestically on the economy. Uh, that's going to be more difficult if North Korea doesn't get sanctions relief. And internally in state media, we've been seeing signs that they're laying the groundwork for sanctions relief not being a realistic possibility. So that's, again, something I think we should keep an eye on going into the next year. But I mean, uh, you know, I'll be I'll actually be on vacation for New Year's Day this year, but I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be watching Kim Jong Un's speech. I think it'll be it'll be quite a significant um, declaration of his intentions for the year ahead, as it has been in the past. Uh, the New Year's Day address in uh, 2017 was when he made clear that North Korea was coming close to developing an ICBM. He followed mm -hmm. through on that. His New Year's Day in 2018 was when he extended the olive branch to South Korea that allowed for the Winter Olympics opening, and also when he called for the mass production of ballistic missiles and nuclear warheads. His New Year's Day address in 2019 was again when he told the United States that they would have to change you know change their approach otherwise north korea would be forced to go down quote a new way and i guess looking at 2020's new year's day address we're probably going to find out what exactly that new way for north korea is going to be yeah absolutely well prashant i think uh i think we should uh close it off there but i know that we'll be back to talking about north korea sooner rather than later definitely well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, for our listeners, if you uh, like what you heard on the podcast, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a future episodes. Um, and if you've been a subscriber for a while but you haven't yet subscribed, um, or sorry, if you've been a listener for a while but you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you do so so you can keep in touch with uh, future episodes. Um, and also, uh, if you could leave us a review on iTunes or Google Play, that would be really, really helpful. It does get the word out about the show. Uh, before we close out the episode, just a note from our sponsor. This episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast is brought to you by Diplomat Risk Intelligence, or DRI. DRI is the consulting and analysis division of The Diplomat, the Asia-Pacific's leading current affairs magazine. Since its launch in 2002, The Diplomat has been dedicated to quality analysis and commentary on events and trends in Asia and around the world, and is now one of the most respected publications covering the region. 
DRI and Harris's approach and offers clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors worldwide access to an exclusive network of subject matter experts and analysts. Whatever your needs in the wider Asia-Pacific region, DRI can offer the knowledge and expertise necessary to anticipate and manage geopolitical and geoeconomic risks. For more information, please visit dri.thediplomat.com. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back soon with more.